The illusion of choice is a thinly veiled dynamic that drives many single player gaming experiences. And while many developers spend a lot of time trying to convince players that choice is real and authentic in their games, the truth more often is that choice is a superficial concept in gaming narrative. Bioshock confronted this idea head on, searing into our minds a innocuous three word phrase with an unforgettable new meaning, would you kindly. Of course, one of the most memorable moments in the game is the would you kindly phrase and the reveal of uh, you know how that's been motivating the player throughout the entire game. Uh, it's still, to me, one of the you know, most classic kind of narrative moments in games in the past decade. What's interesting about that phrase is that it, it didn't always start like that. Can you tell us sort of about the evolution of sort of the, you know, the conditioning of the player and there was once Excelsior was the phrase once? Yeah, this is, <laughs> I'm trying to recall um, some of this. So I, we had the idea, like, because we had the Andrew Ryan scene very early, and we knew sort of all the events that would happen. There were phrases before there was would you kindly. The notion existed and what it meant and what it was, but we didn't actually have the phrase would you kindly until later. So we had a bunch of terms we threw in there. Cause, and like Excelsior was it for one point. That's probably comes from my, my Stan Lee fanboyism. Was that like so throughout the game it would have been like Excelsior? Just randomly there, say There that. are some things when you're making games you just sort of throw in as like, we need Sounds something. Cool we need something. Head over there, Excelsior. And then it sits there yeah. for a year. Right. And then all of a sudden, you kind of forget it's not good, right? right. And then yeah. <laughs> until somebody comes along and says, "Dude, seriously, yeah." What, or you Excelsior? meant it to be like a stub in. You never right. meant yeah. it to actually gain traction, and then you're like, "Oh crap!" But that sense of of some phrase or word being repeated throughout the game that you wouldn't really realize its meaning yes. um, until later. That was there very early on. Yes. Yeah. And the fact that you would have something that seemed like a non-thing and then came back at you like a freight train later on was always that was there from pretty early. Sit. Would you kindly? Stand. Would you kindly? Run. Stop. Turn. A man chooses. A slave obeys. So that phrase evolved, but talk about that, I, you know, the sort of meta-narrative of, you know, being in a game, thinking that you have a sense of choice and making these decisions, but then obviously realizing that the, you know, the player ultimately didn't have choice or was conditioned in a way that they would react to that. Um, that was, you know, sort of, a, sort of a new idea for a game. Where did that come from on your side, Kevin? Was, was there sort of a deeper sort of, uh, you know, meaning behind it? No, look, I, I think I was always interested in the concept, you know, whether it's, you know, Oedipus, not to get too pointy headed here, but Oedipus sort of thinking he has, oh, I'm gonna leave, you know, this city and go to another city because there's been this prophecy about me and I'm gonna avoid my fate and I'm in complete control and then finding out he's not in control at all to the Manchurian candidate, which is a story I love about, you know, somebody who, who you find out is just a puppet, you know, living a life of a man and fight club. You know, I always love those kind of stories about who am I and what is my, agency in this world because look we struggle I think everybody struggles that you know how much how much we really have control over and how much is you know our boss or parents or whatever telling us what to do so uh, that seemed like a natural thing for a story and because it came from movies that idea a lot and plays yeah. I, I don't think it, it was very there was a lot of it hadn't been explored in games really and games are particularly interesting because games because you feel like you, do, you are agency, interacting yeah. with us yeah and you're really being, you know, most games, especially at the time, you're really just being railroaded okay. down a corridor. It's very easy to underestimate gamers, and I think probably I did a little of my own underestimation there that they would, it would be a little too pointy-headed for people, but people seem to really engage, because probably because it spoke to an experience they had, a struggle as a gamer they've always had, which is like, I want to control, but how much control do I really have in this game? Uh -huh. True. And, Sean, I mean, it was also something that, you know, was a great surprise when you played through the game, and I'm sure even for people on the team, did everyone know that when Ken was sort of doing it, or did it was revealed as people played through it? I think, I mean, at some point the, the entire team knew. 
uh, it wasn't, um, it was something that was talked about uh, with a smaller group before you know, it was bought to the entire team. Early on when you, when you heard the idea and you, you just kind of clicks, right? You're like, okay, like I totally get this. Did like people get it? I seem to remember a few people looking at me like I was, I was like a luna, lunatic. Not, maybe not the specifics and maybe it's the Excelsior, or you may be talking about the Excelsior yeah, 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 time, yeah. but the idea that you don't really have choice and exactly like you said, you, you played through how many video games and everybody's game is going to end the same way. You're going to kill these people. You're going to pass through these checkpoints and you think you have a choice, but the only real choice is to stop playing the game. So the, the idea that we're kind of like taking that on resonated. Now the actual, like, is it Excelsior or is it the Latin phrase I forgot, or if it's, would you kindly? See, here's how I remember it. And I could be, you know, I could, I could be wrong. Yeah. I can remember being so surprised by the outside reaction because I remember the internal reaction being completely nobody and connected or engaged to it. I mean, we worked on it. Yeah. And, and so I was kind of surprised by the outside reaction because I kind of thought it was like, you know, as I said, it's a bit academic, right? Yeah. And, and it, well, it could also be a function of... We're playing well, it close to the vest. I could, I could be misremembering it, or it could also just be a function of nobody making the game had the experience of playing it through right. and getting to that so moment. They, yeah, yeah, I, I mean, mean, like it was revealed you're... to them in advance of really playing it, yeah. so it wasn't that surprise. Yeah, they had it's... seen it in all its really half-assed you know, development well, stages and, and along the way. out of order. Yeah, out of order and all and that. And it's not really something you can play test over an afternoon, because it takes a little while to get to that point. You, la you need to lack the knowledge about yeah. what the game is to be able to sort of have that um, experience all the way through. I know you guys have talked about uh, you know the idea of Atlas, the you know the voice actor changing, and it was I guess very important that the you nailed that actor right, and, and you trusted that actor until there was sort of the re the Fontaine reveal and sort of understanding that. Yeah, trust was everything there, right? And so there was something about either the actor or the writing or the accent that just m people immediately said this guy's no good. Right. When the, the first Atlas we had, because you have to trust this guy, and at least if you don't, there's no trust. There's no, you know, there's no punch in the gut. I think we have really focused on making him have personal stakes in the story as well. That he had his family trapped. And of course, it was all fiction, right? Yeah. But his fan, he had, he had, he had skin in the game. He, you know, he sort of spoke to you as a friend, and especially because the whole world was so hostile to you. I think it took a while to get that exactly right. Listen, I've got a family. I need to get them out of here. But the Splicers have cut me off from them. If you can reach them in Neptune's bounty, then maybe, just maybe, I know you must feel like the unluckiest man in the world right now, but you're the only hope I'll ever see my wife and child again. Sean, what do you hope is the kind of lasting legacy of Bioshock? You know, 10 years hence, a lot of things you guys were doing, uh, you know, or have sort of been become common now, right, with, you know, upgrades and moral choices and games yeah. and whatnot, but it was really pioneering work um, a decade ago. When you reflect on it, what do you, what do you hope people remember the game for sort of pushing forward? For me, it's, it's telling a story with the medium and how we used everything available to us to tell that story. Um, we used the environment to set up the backstory of Rapture and really create a sense of space which I think is vitally important to getting the players to trust that, you know, to sit down and kind of like just be in the space and, and let these things happen. You know, even, uh, even the radio logs, uh, the rudimentary animation that we had at the time, I mean, we really sat down with the tools that we had and at our disposal and tried to tell a meaningful story. I mean, not meaningful, but something that would be memorable to people that they could take away and, like you said earlier, have that water cooler moment where they're excited enough to, to talk about it after they've put the controller down. So for me, I, I think the legacy is that um, it was a story well told. For me, it was a sense of place being like the rapture is a real thing, even though it's not. You know, it's actually a very crude, you know, the, from the time, you know, we're always a big crude bunch of polygons and texture maps. Yeah. You know, it's only, the original game is only in 720, I think. And I played a lot of it when we were testing it on a 14-inch, on a like, you know, uh, SD television. That it still felt like a sense of place in the music and the, and the characters. That it's a real place. And I think that my memories of the Bioshock games is that I take away that Rapture's a real place and Elizabeth's a real person. Those are the two sort of big things that stick with me with those two games. And that's sort of what I'll always, you know, carry forward with me in my life. Bioshock is, you know, it's a place, but as we saw with Infinite, I mean, it's an idea and it's a sort of a type of game. I think a lot of people say like, oh, this is a, you know, a type of experience. Um, when you think about, you know, 
your career where you guys want to go. I mean, do you, that idea of those types of games, do you miss it now that you've sort of moved on to other things now, or do you feel like it's sort of you've closed that chapter? I mean, it's always a part of what you do. Like, System Shock 2 was a part of Bioshock, there were, but it, it wasn't System Shock 2. It was, it was a gro you know, you're growing past that and trying out new things. I, I think Bioshock and Bioshock Infinite, and even going back to Swap 4, those will always be a part of my experience as a game developer and, and what we're trying to do with the medium. So I don't think it's something that you just draw a line and say, you know, we'll never return, because there's always lessons that you can learn and things that you bring with you to the, to the next project that you're working on. Yeah. I don't think the new game is going to, like, people are, like, are not going to be surprised that it's a, this game is a new game from us. They're going to see a lot of what we had done in, before in terms of world building and aspects of storytelling. Um, the goal is to sort of, you know, move away from the you really have no choice kind of kind of thing and that's a very 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 hard problem which we spent years working on but we're building upon a foundation of stuff we've done before um, just trying to go in a different direction with it but it's 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 always going to be part of our DNA city where the artist would not be in the sense where the scientists would not be bound by petty morality, where the great would not be constrained by the small. And with the sweat of your brow, rapture can become your city as well.